Okay, I think we can begin uh, this morning's lecture. If you look on the uh, syllabus, I think it's advertised as the macroeconomics of uh, government finance. Uh, the slideshow uh, that I have to go along with it, I call macroeconomics of taxes and tax reform. I don't see any perceived difference, really, of the, of the two topics. I'm not trying to shift from one topic to another, and it'll be a wide-ranging lecture uh, that deals with a number of issues uh, related to government spending and uh, tax collection and uh, deficit spending and those sorts of fiscal uh, issues. Uh, even in my book, In Time and Money, I devote a chapter uh, to uh, the fiscal issues as opposed to the monetary issues and give it a workout in terms of the uh, diagrammatics of capital-based macroeconomics. And I'll do just a little bit of that today, but not much. I think I, I want to be more wide-ranging than uh, that would permit. Uh, and I want to start by mentioning, mentioning a book that's a longtime favorite of mine and probably of many in this audience, but uh, make some excuses for not uh, following it uh, throughout my lecture. The book is by Franz Oppenheimer, and it's titled simply, The State. Uh, the particular copy I have uh, has that title in bold red, and the background is a, a black and white photo of an expansive field littered with corpses. <laughs> and that image sticks in my mind uh, with the title uh, superimposed uh, on that image. But I mention uh, Franz Oppenheimer because he takes a particular position on taxes that uh, many libertarians uh, warm up to, and it, do it does give you something of a warm feeling. Uh, because uh, Oppenheimer begins his analysis by saying that there are two methods of acquiring wealth. And one method uh, is, uh, is production and exchange. And you've heard a lot about that this week. And the second method is confiscation under the threat of violence. It's another method, right? And for shorthand, production and exchange, he, he simply calls the economic means. And confiscation under threat of violence, he calls the political means. All right, and then he defines government as the organization of the political means. All right, and uh, condemns taxation uh, roundly, um, condemns uh, taxes, the IRS, and so on. So if we follow Oppenheimer all the way, our treatment of taxes can be short and sweet. Taxation. It's theft. Taxes are immoral. We're against it. End of story. End of lecture. We can quit. Okay, right there. We've got to the, we've got to the end. Uh, and, and so I'm not going to take the Oppenheimer view, although I certainly will, will recognize it, as I just have. But it's a little too facile uh, from the standpoint of the economist. Okay? A trained economist can have something to say about uh, different ways of collecting taxes and the relationship between uh, taxes and spending and so on. So I propose to uh, raise and hopefully answer uh, a number of questions uh, in this lecture. Uh, one that we can uh, dispense with fairly quickly uh, and uh, shows some similarity between what Austrians have to say and what uh, good neoclassical economists have to say, does the tax take measure the burden of government? Let's just look at the other questions. Are all taxes dollar for dollar equally harmful? Uh, you can guess the answer to that question, and it's one that uh, Oppenheimer view would uh, cause us to miss. Uh, are taxes better or worse than budget deficits? And here I would say that the Austrians have something unique to say uh, in this area. Uh, that you just don't find in the mainstream. Uh, what's the case for the flat tax? And when I say flat tax here, maybe I should have capitalized it, signifying the title of the book by Hall and Rebushka, whose proposal actually isn't for a flat tax at all, although that's what they call it. Uh, is a consumption tax preferable to an income tax? There are books written, legislation proposed to switch from an income tax to a flat tax. So those are some, some of the questions that, uh, that I intend to get to. Uh, 
And let's start out with the, with the question of does taxes measure the burden of government? And I'll start with uh, Friedman's point and, and, and give him his due, give him credit for arguments he has made. He made them in a timely fashion to counter uh, arguments to the contrary. And uh, according to Friedman, uh, he says government spending rather than the total tax take is closer to the mark engaging the burden of government, all right? And uh, there, there's a point there. He's, he's got the point. Uh, government is, uh, government spending uh, has to be equal to, uh, well, the tax take, which, of which they spend all of, plus the rest they spend and didn't collect in taxes, which we call summarily the budget deficit. <coughs> and it's G rather than T uh, that gets us closer to measuring the burden. If you think about it, uh, the government is out there spending money, and when they spend money, they're taking command of resources. And think in real terms. The resources they're taking command of are resources that you can't take command of. So they've taken them out of the private sector, leaving the private sector uh, the rest of the resources. All right? uh, Friedman's point is that uh, it matters not, or matters little, uh, about just how the government takes command of those resources. Does it do it through taxation and spending or borrowing and spending? Uh, he considers the method of finance to be very much a subsidiary question, a second order and, and, and not even a close second, to the question of how much total are they spending? How much total resources are they taking, uh, are they uh, commanding with the G? Uh, and I think he's right about that up to a point, although uh, as I will argue, that uh, at uh, high enough levels of deficits, and these days we're getting pretty high, uh, people have trouble even fathoming the extent of the deficit. Our total debt is quickly approaching $8 trillion, and uh, annual borrowing is something around uh, $400 billion, which of course translates into well over a billion dollars a day. Uh, seven days a week uh, of borrowing by the federal government. If you get budget deficits up high enough and hold them there, if you have chronically large federal budget deficits, then it can matter uh, the particular way of collecting. In other words, uh, yes, G is what, uh, what measures how much resources the government commands, but it might do a lot of harm to the economy uh, if it gets its deficits uh, as high as it has had them lately, okay? Um, Dick Wagner, who some of you know or know of, he teaches at George Mason, taught at Auburn at one time, um, argues that even Friedman uh, is short on his estimate of the total burden of government. Uh, uh, he, uh, Wagner says we'd have to throw in the tax equivalent or the government spending equivalent of uh, burden of regulation and I think, I'm pretty sure, that Friedman would simply see that as a friendly amendment. I think that Friedman would accept that as true. Let me give you a couple of illustrations, one that is sort of standard, and the other one that's just fun to think about. Uh, the standard illustration is uh, something about environmental concerns that might require companies to install uh, what they call smokestack scrubbers on their smokestacks. As Tom DeLorenzo talked about smokestack scrubbers, uh, and you can imagine a couple of ways of doing that. Uh, the way it's done or has been done in the past is simply to require, in other words, regulation. The government just requires uh, firms in certain circumstances to install these rather expensive smokestack scrubbers uh, so as to hold down the level of pollution. Okay, Now, Whatever burden that imposes on the private sector uh, is, not con is not captured by T, certainly, or not even by G. Right? It's something else. It's regulation. And Dick Wagner makes the point uh, that requiring such devices uh, are perfectly equivalent, as far as measuring burdens are concerned, uh, with a scheme of tax and spend. In other words, the government could increase the tax take in some particular way, which of course has its own burdens, uh, and use the funds to, to buy these tax or these uh, smokestack scrubbers that are installed uh, in factories of one sort or another. 
And so there's a tax and spend equivalent uh, to regulations, and there's no reason to to exempt the regulation from reckoning of the burden uh, just because it happens to be a regulation and not a tax and spend scheme. Okay, uh, so so the burden uh, is is better stated by G than T, but it's bigger yet uh, due to the uh, regulatory effects such as the one I've just mentioned. Another one that's uh, worth thinking about, and I think it's just fun to think about, is a particular regulation uh, on the automobile industry for gas mileage, uh, something called CAFE standards, C-A-F-E, which stands for, I always forget, Corporate Average Fuel Economy. There, I got it right. You know, the letters lined up in here, Corporate Average Fuel Economy. And uh, those uh, regulations have been imposed uh, for some years, and they get tighter uh, as the years go by. But even from the start, they were po imposed differentially. They applied to automobiles, one particular gas mileage, and then trucks, which are bigger. They're going to not get so good a gas mileage, a higher uh, standard or, or, or higher miles per gallon as the minimum standard uh, for a gas mileage. And also, uh, they're applied... Uh, to the fleet. In other words, a, a given car company uh, has, to, has to achieve that average for his whole fleet of cars. It's not, a, it's not an average imposed on any particular model or make or, 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 or car with a given weight or what. It's just, it's just applied across the board. All the cars you sell, do they get on average a certain mileage per gallon? Or all the trucks uh, that you produce, do they get on average a certain uh, mileage per gallon? Now, uh, I raise this point here just because it's still another instance of a regulation that could have been achieved by a tax and spend policy, which then would have been uh, included in even Friedman's uh, reckoning of the burden of government. The government could have collected taxes and used the money to pay uh, automakers for doing research and improving gas mileage or actually implementing uh, ways of, of getting uh, higher gas mileage for their cars and trucks, okay? But uh, as it was applied, it created some, some very strange perversities that the automobile uh, companies act, reacted to in very predictable ways. Uh, they sought almost immediately to take advantage of the fact that you could produce trucks that would use more gas than cars. That differential was in there, okay? Uh, and if you think back to the, what, late 80s or late 70s, let's go back that far, uh, you didn't have many vehicles on the road that were cars but kind of looked like trucks, okay? You just didn't have that. You had a few. You had something called the Wagoneer made by Jeep, okay? Not many people bought them. They weren't very popular. Who wants a car that looks like a truck? You know? And yet, uh, the automakers perceived that uh, they, could, they could deal with these standards more effectively if they made cars look like trucks, all right? And they had a, a particular way of abbreviating. You know what the abbreviation is for a car that looks like a truck? It's called SUV, <laughs> okay? <laughs> the whole sport utility vehicle, okay, was born of the CAFE standards. That's where it came from, all right? That's where you got the phase out of the old time full size station wagon with the wood paneling on the side. Maybe you didn't like that anyhow, okay, but uh, uh, the station wagons uh, were, were gone, and instead you had cars that looked like trucks, right? And at the time, the standard, you have to have a, a government standard what's a car and what's a truck, okay? This is all complicated now by crossover vehicles, you see, but what's a car and what's a truck? Well, in the early days, uh, a truck uh, was defined in terms of its frame. If it had a truck chassis, truck frame, truck suspension, it's a truck. Never mind what you build on top of the truck, okay? Well, good, you can build Broncos and Blazers and, you know, on and on. Build all sorts of vehicles that, that look like cars or, or are sold for cars, uh, but are classified as a truck. Uh, so that you can meet those standards. Uh, and uh, I have to hand it to the big automakers of the public relations job they did. They advertised those things, and, and they caught on. And people love them, okay? Uh, 
and the, 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 the more truck-like their car looks, you know, the better they like it. And in fact, they were so successful in that regard in their advertising and the demand for those things that uh, the scales were tipped against them. In other words, the, the people wanted bigger trucks, you know, uh, not just the Explorer, but uh, Expedition or Excursion and so on, you know, those things are huge, okay? So huge that uh, eventually it became even more difficult for the car manufacturers to uh, meet the standards for trucks and for cars because they were so big. They couldn't even meet the truck standards. Right? What are they going to do? Well, this legislation changes from time to time, and even the definition of what's a car and what's a truck changes from time to time, and uh, helps bail them out, because I'll, I'll remind you that uh, the truck gas mileage they have to meet is not the mileage for any one truck or for the biggest truck or for individual trucks or anything like that. It's, it's for all the trucks they sell, okay? For all the trucks they sell. And so the standards now are not in terms of the chassis. Uh, and in fact, many of the sport use, like Explorer and Ford and, and many others, I'm sure, uh, are now mounted on automobile chassis. So they're not trucks from the standpoint of chassis and have to qualify for, as a truck for, uh, in other ways. But one of the things that qualifies a vehicle as a truck now is uh, having a flat cargo area. Okay, if it has a flat cargo area, it can be classified as a truck, and the firms take advantage of this in classifying if they, if they make some small trucks or they make some cars that have seats that fold down or something like that. They call it a truck, and that, that uh, lowers the gas mileage of the whole fleet, you see. So you might not know it, but uh, if you drive today, for instance, a Chrysler PT Cruiser, you know what they look like? You know what they are? They were kind of cute when they came out, at least, but they haven't changed. But they, there they are. PT. Is that a car or a truck? It's a truck. It's a truck. Okay. So it officially now qualifies as a truck because it's, it's cute and little, and it gets good gas mileage, and it helps uh, average out over the, you know, the huge Dodge Ram, you know, macho things that they also like to produce. So... I would argue that there's been tremendous costs, tremendous inefficiencies, and tremendous costs involved in, in the automobile industry trying to satisfy consumers while constrained by that sort of regulation. And I can't imagine the procedure it would take to, to translate that cost, that burden, into an equivalent tax and spend scheme. Okay? But nonetheless, I will accept Dick Wagner's point, and I think even Friedman would too that uh, the, the costs of regulation uh, are also a big part of the burden of government. Now, uh, I'll come back to this issue later when we begin to set, consider uh, the effects of deficit finance as opposed uh, to taxes. Uh, are all taxes dollar for dollar equally harmful? Well, no, uh, they're not. And uh, one proposition that... Uh, uh, is pretty much uncontested, I think, is that the narrower the tax base, the greater, at least, the more concentrated uh, the distortion of economic activity, because there are more options there are for substituting out. And uh, the example I'll give is George Bush, that was uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, the first one, uh, who proposed and instituted a yacht tax. How many remember the yacht tax? Okay, and, and it was also put on... Uh, Luxury vehicles, which were defined at the time as any vehicle that cost more than thirty thousand dollars. <laughs> so I think that now that's everything but a PT cruiser. <laughs> the, uh, but uh, luxury vehicles and yachts were subject to a tax. It was an enormously popular proposal uh, because it was perceived as taxing the rich. I mean, who buys who buys yachts? The rich, okay. And so you tax the rich and uh, can ease up. Uh, on the poor. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, at the time that this legislation was going into a, a, a effect, I had an exam question on my principal's uh, exam that uh, asked the students to use graphical analysis to show the actual effects that the yacht tax would have. Right? And many of you 
probably know what that is, but let me just uh, 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 spell it out and what happened, what actually did happen with the yacht tax and how predictable it was just by knowing a little bit of uh, principles level economics. Okay? Now, you impose a big tax on yachts, and the price of yachts go up, and guess what? The demand for yachts go down. Okay? Now, a lot of people who were, ad, who were in favor of the yacht tax even denied that. No, no, it won't go down because these are rich people, and they don't care about prices. They just buy our yacht. Okay? Well, I'm sorry. It turns out that, that the marginal yacht buyer <laughs> cares about the price. <laughs> okay? The marginal yacht buyer is stretching a little to buy that yacht. Okay? It's true that for rich people, if the price of toothpaste goes up, you know, they probably don't brush less often. <laughs> they just buy the toothpaste. But when it comes to yachts, they don't buy the yacht. Now, one of the reasons that uh, not only the marginal buyers, but even uh, more wealthy buyers don't buy the yacht when the price goes up is because there are lots of other things out there to buy for rich people, okay? There are a lot of substitutes. There's, there's a lot of ways to spend a lot of money. Mediterranean vacations or, you know what? There's a lots of different choices. That's why it's so good to be rich, okay? Because you don't just have to buy a yacht, okay? You can buy a yacht, but you can buy a lot of other things too. And when the yacht tax was imposed, a lot of people bought a lot of other things. Right? And the demand for yachts went down. Now, that wasn't the end of the story, of course. The rest of the story is in terms of what happens around the old yacht yard. <laughs> yacht yards uh, employ lots of people. But, and maybe you haven't been at a yacht yard lately. I haven't, but I've read up on it. And I can tell you that the, that the people that are employed in the yacht yard are not rich people. <laughs> They tend to be low-income people. They tend to be poor people. Uh, to, to keep yachts in repair, keep them clean, keep them managed one way or another, and just to do, do all sorts of services. Yacht builders even, okay? Yachts get built. There's a supply of yachts. And the people who work building yachts are not rich people, okay? They're, they're low-income people, all right? And those people suffered mightily from the yacht test because they lost their jobs. And so the incidence of the yacht tax, uh, tax was disastrous. Uh, it, it didn't hurt the rich much because there were so many other things they could spend their money on. It hurt the, the people in the, the, in, in the yacht business uh, mightily, and that impinged uh, greatly on the low-income people. Uh, and, of course, that was what the graphics show, and if you do it uh, just in simple supply and demand analysis, and it was easy to do even before the yacht tax went into existence. Um, Eventually, that yacht tax was removed, and precisely for the reason that it had those consequences. But it wasn't a matter of economic reasoning that allowed them to see that that's what the consequences would be. It was just hit them in the face observation of that's what happened. Okay? And they realized that they're not taxing the rich at all. They're putting uh, tremendous burdens uh, on lower income people because of that yacht tax, and it was eventually repealed. Okay? Well, that was a learning experience for the government, I guess, <laughs> but a rather expensive one. Um, and if you look at the other end of that spectrum, the broader the base, the less distortion uh, of economic activity. And consider, for instance, an income tax with a low rate. And about all we can do is consider it right now, because instead we have an income tax with pretty high rate. Uh, and, 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 and getting that rate down low is, is of course, part of the strategy of uh, getting control of the government uh, and uh, has some uh, issues and political alliances that I'll bring up uh, later. Uh, so the broader the base, the less, the less distortions you have uh, of the sort that you had uh, with the yacht tax. That's, that's the point here. Uh, I guess before I go on to this, I will say that uh, there's, there's a gut level case for narrowing the base so dramatically that that in itself limits how much the government can tax, okay? Uh, we might be in favor, for instance, of uh, 
letting the government set its tax rate however high it wants, just based on judgment of social well-being and anticipated expenditure, just set it as high as it, as it wants, but to adopt as a tax base only the sale of anchovies or perhaps raspberries, okay? That's a narrow tax base. And let them go at it, okay? Just tax it as much as they want. How much taxes could they raise, okay? Not too much. Uh, but to be more practical about it, it uh, the, the, uh, the better goal, I think, is to have a broad-based tax, but to figure out how to keep that tax low. And we'll see possible means later on in this lecture. Uh, one of the areas where I have written in uh, the most, and I have something to say about it in time and money, is this next issue, are, are taxes better or worse than uh, budget deficits? And you see, Friedman would say, well, it doesn't matter. And if it does matter, uh, it doesn't matter much compared with the overall size of government. And uh, to some extent, I'll, I'll, I'll give him his due. But I think if, uh, if we end up with chronically large federal budget deficits, uh, that can have effects that uh, are much more harmful than an equivalent amount of taxes. Okay. Uh, just as an aside, I want you to note the, the flip-flop in the arguments made by the deficit apologists. Uh, if you go back uh, to the 1960s, uh, the apologists for the deficit, I think they got this phrase from Abba Lerner, but I would have to check uh, to make sure. In the 1960s, they said, don't worry about the deficit, we just owe it to ourselves. Okay? We owe it to ourselves. That was, that was almost just a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, from, in, from any politician uh, if a question was raised about a large deficit. We just owe it to ourselves. Uh, and I think it was Murray Rothbard who uh, explained uh, uh, that that argument is in the category of, of proves too much. Okay? Murray liked to use that argument, and he used it very effectively. Uh, and, and he could say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, we don't need to worry about deficits because we owe it to ourselves. And... We don't need to worry about theft either, because we're just stealing from ourselves, okay? <laughs> Murder's no problem, just killing ourselves. I mean. And of course, the problem is some people are killing others, some people are stealing from others, and uh, deficits are no different. There are, there are borrowers and lenders, and they uh, end up differentially influenced uh, by that debt. Uh, and now, but nowadays, nowadays, in the 21st century, you see a very different argument. They no longer say we owe it to ourselves. Uh, they say we have access to world capital markets. <laughs> we owe it to those suckers on the other side of the ocean. <laughs> so don't worry about it. All right. Totally different argument. And I have to say this, it's the argument that is most closely associated with supply-side economics. Supply-siders make uh, uh, their deficit apology, apologies are all in terms of we have world ex access to uh, we have access to world capital markets, and so we shouldn't worry about the deficit. Well, the deficit right now is around 400 billion, borrowing at a pretty good clip. But as the supply siders say, uh, that's just a drop in the bucket compared to the availability of credit in world capital markets. I've uh, pushed some of them to add, to, to tell me well. How big is that bucket? Okay, how big is that? It's hard to get estimates. How do you how do you get estimates of uh, world supply of loanable funds? Okay, but the estimates I've heard, at least from some of my supply side friends, is is something on the order of tens of trillions of dollars. Okay, so if there are tens of trillions of dollars available out there for borrowing, and we're just borrowing four hundred billion, it's just a drop in the bucket. Don't worry about. It. All right. Now, I would say that, the, that, that that's subject to Rothbard's criticism of proves too much. Okay? It proves too much. Because if it were true, if you take it at face value, then if one drop in the bucket doesn't hurt much, how much could five or six hurt? Five or six drops in the bucket. And yet, with five or six drops in the bucket, we could eliminate taxation. Okay? And we know that taxation is burdensome. So um, let's do that. Right? And at least let's press the supply siders to make the case of why we shouldn't do that and just finance government spending exclusively uh, out of borrowing. Okay?
I've never heard their argument. Uh, or put it another way, if $400 uh, billion dollars is not a problem, then at what level of deficit would even the supply-siders consider the problem? I haven't heard a defensible answer about that from, uh, from the supply-siders. But here I just want to point out how the apologetics have flip-flopped over the years. Uh, one of the issues that uh, you'd think we wouldn't have to debate, but we do, is that uh, the question is our current and projected budgets large, or I should have said budget deficits uh, large, left out the word deficits, or budget deficits large. And uh, you know, you think it just sort of hits you in the face, yeah, 400 billion, that sounds a bit much. All right. Even in historical standards, you know, except, except for periods of all-out war, World War II and so on, uh, we don't generally borrow at those levels. Uh, and certainly not chronically so. Uh, as has been going on in, in recent years. But uh, there's an army of economists out there, and, and again, largely supply-siders, uh, who, who want to chalk that number down. Okay, a little PR here, a little public relations. Let's, let, let, let me convince you that $400 billion really isn't that much money. Okay? That's, that's quite a job to do. Okay? But they've got their ways of doing it, and I want to alert you to some of them so that you can see uh, the inadvisability of using, uh, using these uh, criteria. Is it large? Well, how about compared to gross domestic product? Well, no, it's a pretty small percentage of gross domestic product. But if you remember your macro at the principal's level, what you learn is that GDP uh, is, is essentially everything. You add up everything, okay, that's produced and earned and so on in the economy. It gives you gross domestic product. And it's, it's almost trivially true to say that anything, any one thing, is pretty small compared with everything. Isn't that right? I mean, just, just by the nature of things, any one thing, uh, including uh, the federal budget deficit, is fairly small compared to everything. One of my favorite politicians to, to watch, not to vote for, uh, Everett Dirksen of years ago, senator from uh, Illinois, uh, argued that the, that the main function of GDP was to make every other number look small by comparison. <laughs> okay? <laughs> That's its role. <laughs> and uh, it's widely used by the apologists of the deficits. Um, compared to private borrowing, you, know, you hear this argument that government borrowing isn't all that much compared to private borrowing. Okay? Uh, but think for a minute what's being said. Uh, uh, the, gov the, the argument here is that don't worry about the tremendous demands that the government is making on credit markets because the private sector is out there making tremendous demands on those same credit markets at the same time. Does that cause you to worry less? Two tremendous demands on credit markets. Okay. The next argument is similar to that. How about compared to the deficits of other Western countries. Some are worse than the U.S., some are better than the U.S., okay? Uh, we're about average, or were. I think we might be gaining, <laughs> okay? Uh, and so, uh, look, uh, U.S. government borrowing is, is not much better or worse than borrowings of other Western countries. Again, we're talking about demands on credit markets. Don't worry about how much demands on credit markets the U.S. government is making. After all, other Western countries are making huge demands on those same credit markets of their own. Okay? They all have access to world credit markets. Okay? Now, is that a reason to worry less or maybe worry more? Okay? We're making these tremendous demands, and at the same time that other countries are doing the same thing, boy, you know, that, that might cause something. Well, one thing it causes, it, it causes us to think through uh, just what the comparison ought to be, okay? And, and, and let me see if I can't get you to see what the comparison ought to be. Do you compare the demands on credit markets with other demands? What else might you compare those demands to? How about supplies, okay? So what's critical, and here we're talking about the U.S., and the U.S. government, which taxes its U.S. citizens, okay? Okay? 
and the option is borrowing. So let's look at the saving that those U.S. citizens are doing. In other words, compare uh, government borrowing to private saving, because that's what there is to be borrowed, at least domestically. And, and it turns out, of course, if, if you don't borrow it all domestically, and you couldn't possibly because there's not enough there, then you have to have access to world capital markets. You've got to borrow it uh, from overseas. Right? Uh, but uh, by this standard, uh, the U.S. budget deficits uh, are way out of line on a historical basis because the deficits have been going up. And what do you think has been happening to savings over the last couple of years? It's been going down. Okay, so you've got saving, saving going down and borrowing going up. So you get a double whammy there, uh, a crunch, that, uh, and something has to be done about it. Uh, and now, of course, the kicker that would be added to the supply side, sort of the bailout, oh yes, oh yes, not domestic saving, look at saving across the world, the world capital markets, okay? So the idea is that, okay, if you, as long as you have access to world capital markets, once again, you don't have to worry about the deficits. Now, I want to deal with that uh, more specifically. Let me give you an example. Uh, these numbers aren't too far off the mark, but they're uh, for purposes of illustration. Uh, suppose the government collects in taxes about two trillion six hundred billion, okay? Uh, and let's say that the tax is about two trillion two hundred billion, right? Well, that's what gets you the deficit of uh, four hundred billion dollars, right? Now, the argument that I make has to do with the uh, qualitative difference between the T and the G minus T. You can look at the two numbers and see that, yes, yes, so uh, we're, we're financing government spending in two ways, and predominantly with taxes, 2.2 billion. But, to some degree, if only $400 billion <laughs> with deficits. So how could, how could we spend our time worrying about the deficits rather than simply worrying about taxes? Or worrying about government spending. Right? And I say there is an argument for that. There is an argument that we, we want to spay, pay special attention uh, to those deficits. And it goes like this. Uh, the taxes are collected in accordance with the tax code. We could give a whole lecture on that, of course. The complications, the modifications, the incomprehensibilities, and the necessity of you employing a tax accountant just to go through all the forms and all that. But when push comes to shove, at least it's codified. It's there in black and white. You can get it and read it or pay your tax consultant to get it and read it. You know what taxes you're going to be subject to. You can plan your affairs accordingly uh, so as to minimize that tax burden. And then at the end of the tax year, you have your taxes figured up. You bite the bullet and send in the money. And, You've gotten through another year. Okay, the tax code sh shows you what the rules of the game are. They're complicated rules, all too complicated. Uh, they're not they're not uh, steeped in fairness, but okay. Uh, at least we know what the rules are. We know them in advance. Okay, but I'm going to put this next term up here and, and ask yourselves if you've ever seen it before. The deficit code. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's what. <laughs> You know, I've given a lecture like this before, and the hands go up. Well, would you explain what that is? What is a deficit code? Okay. What's a deficit code? And, of course, that's the point. There is no deficit code. In other words, it's deuces wild. The government makes no claims about just how it will get this money. Okay. Makes no claims about just how it will get this money. But you know it's going to get it somehow. You don't know just, just how. You don't know just when. You don't know just who's. <laughs> and now go ahead and plan your affairs. <laughs> and I hope it's not you, okay? but it may well be. Uh, there's no way to hedge against this. There's no tax consultant you can hire to predict uh, what, uh, what burden that gov government deficit will have on you. But I can show you some possible consequences and some historical outcomes that I think are enlightening. Uh, let's see what goes here. Okay, let me try again. Yeah, 
I'm glad I got it that way. Uh, one thing the government can do, but hasn't been doing much lately, it has done in uh, certain historical episodes in the past, it can borrow domestically. It, 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 can, it can borrow from U.S. citizens by selling them uh, treasury bills and bonds and so on, and, and, and more normally selling those treasury bills and bonds to uh, pension funds and insurance companies and banks and so on with which you do business. So uh, many of you or many of your parents in earlier episodes uh, have owned, if only indirectly, lots of treasury bills and bonds and so on because the government is borrowing domestically. Right? Now, if it does that, what do you think the consequences are going to be? Now, I'm going to list the other options before I start talking about consequences. Uh, the other option, of course, is borrow from the Federal Reserve. And it has to do this, if you read up on your Federal Reserve, it has to do this in a rather indirect way. Uh, only to a limited extent can the Treasury sell Treasury bills directly to the Federal Reserve, but typically it coordinates its activities, and at the same time it's issuing and selling Treasury bills, the uh, central bank is out there buying those Treasury bills, uh, accommodating the Treasury, as the expression goes. Okay. So that's a, that's a second alternative, a way of borrowing. Okay, and the third way, uh, borrow abroad. They can sell those treasury bills uh, to central banks of other countries or to uh, citizens or private in the private sector of other countries. That's the access to oil capital markets. You see. Now let's go back and look at the consequences. What happens when you borrow domestically? Uh, you get high interest rates, okay? This bids up interest rates. Um, what happens if you borrow from the Federal Reserve? Uh, when it buys treasury bills, it's, uh, this is called monetizing the debt. My students have trouble, and it, I don't blame it on them. Any students will have trouble figuring out what's meant by monetizing the debt, okay? Uh, is anyone in here trying to get your debt monetized? Okay. Can you imagine going out to the bank and saying, I've got all this debt, and I'm having trouble spending it. Now, if you'll just take it and give me the money, I'll be able to spend. Okay? You can't do that, right? They won't, they won't accommodate you. Nobody can do that, except the Federal Reserve. Okay? The Federal Reserve can monetize the debt, buy the debt from the Treasury, and the Treasury has money to spend. Okay? But uh, that, of course, causes inflation. You're monetizing debt. You've got more money in the system. Uh, prices are being bid up. Uh, you've got uh, more inflation. Uh, borrow abroad, you can do that, but it causes weak export markets for reasons that are pretty easy to see. But if you borrow abroad, what that means is that your trading partners are, are coming to the U.S. shores with goods in their cargo bays, and they've got lots of goods. I mean, they've got uh, stereos, they've got cameras, they've got automobiles, okay? But they're leaving with treasury bills in their glove compartments, okay? So they're not buying anything here on the way back. And so people that used to sell those foreign trading partners lots of stuff, uh, the timber industry in the Northwest and uh, all sorts of industries all over the country dispersed over, they can't sell, okay? Because the foreign trading partners aren't buying. They're buying treasury bills instead, all right? So you end up with weak export markets and a, and a, and a big uh, trade deficit. Trade deficit now is, uh, I think, a little over half of the budget deficit. Okay, so that's, that's what accounts for most of that budget deficit now. Uh, let me avoid uh, being misinterpreted. I don't want to claim that trade deficits are bad in their own right. They're not. Uh, trade deficits might just reflect the fact that, uh, that uh, the U.S. is a good place to invest. So um, foreigners could sell their goods here and invest their funds here in, in plant and equipment and tools and machinery. Uh, in fact, that's what happened throughout a large part of the 19th century that allowed the U.S. to grow as rapidly as it did. We had big trade deficits because this was the land of opportunity. People invested here. Okay? Nothing inherently wrong with trade deficits. But, but trade deficits can be a symptom of the fact that they're not borrowing or they're not, they're, they're not investing in the U.S. They're simply lending money to our government. Right? And uh, that's, that's where you get the weak export markets and, and uh, that particular effect of deficit spending. Now, can you put uh, 
Episodes with each of these possibilities, uh, domestic borrowing and high interest rates in the late 1960s, uh, the business news was um, full of discussions of the ongoing credit crunch, as it was called, Nixon credit crunch. And the credit crunch was, was simply a consequence of the fact that the Nixon administration was borrowing lots of money and was borrowing it domestically, driving interest rates up, and firms were cut out of the uh, market for loanable funds. They couldn't get credit because it was being borrowed by the U.S. So uh, that, was, that was the way the burden of the deficit imposed itself at that time. Uh, borrowing from the Fed, inflation, of course, that's the Carter administration. If you remember, and uh, most of you are old enough now, you can, some of you are anyhow, yeah, remember the Carter administration. When uh, Carter was first elected uh, in, uh, what was it, 70, 1976, maybe some of you aren't old enough now. Uh, that uh, he went back to Plains, Georgia and began putting his whole cabinet together before he ever took office, which was sort of unprecedented. He had a full cabinet before he stepped into Washington. And he, he announced uh, that uh, his team was going to hit the ground running. Okay? And of course, uh, in terms of monetary policy, it meant he was going to hit the ground printing, <laughs> okay? which he did. Uh, and uh, so the deficits were accommodated by monetary authority, and you got a lot of inflation. Uh, broad, uh, borrowing abroad, that's something that's ongoing, but was started uh, mainly by the Reagan administration. Okay? that the Reagan administration uh, ended up with uh, lots of deficits much higher than had been run by Carter or any other previous administration. But they were accommodated by our foreign trading partners. Okay? And, and that gave rise to the whole literature on the twin, def the twin deficits okay? in the budget and in foreign trade. And we've had that to some extent uh, or another ever since. So I'll put the Bush Clinton Bush down here <laughs> under uh, borrowing abroad. Ray, Reagan set the pace and uh, they picked up on it. Now, so what we see is, is uh, there certainly are consequences of running a deficit, but they can be different consequences and, and the government isn't obligated to let you know just how it's going to play itself out. It's not going to, it doesn't have to tell you, in fact can't tell you in, in some instances, uh, how it's going to play itself out. It can tell you whether it's going to monetize or not, but it can't tell you whether the buyers of those bills are going to be U.S. citizens or foreign citizens. Okay? So there's no way to know uh, when you plan your affairs whether to count on high interest rates or count on inflation or count on weak export markets. And it turns into a situation where if you are chief executive officer of some firm, uh, you're trying to figure out the best way to produce goods to satisfy consumers, but that can take a back seat to you're trying to figure out what kind of market conditions you're going to be facing. Are you going to be facing high interest rates? Are you going to be facing inflation? Are you going to be facing weak export? Well, you don't know because there's no deficit code. There's no way to figure this out. And, and that, I would argue, uh, percent, uh, 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 creates an excess burden over and above what taxing would cause because at least taxing is done in accordance with a particular tax code and so you, you do know. Okay? Now let me show you the uh, empirical results with this. I think it's sort of interesting. Uh, these, these things have been picked up in the literature uh, and uh, there are lots of articles. You can find lots of articles and summary articles to test empirically. Now, this isn't done by the Austrians, you can imagine. The Austrians don't do that much empirical work. Uh, we read a lot of it, all right, and we're critical of a lot of it, don't do a lot of it. Uh, but here it's easy to be critical. So let me show you what the, what the results are. I can tell you a few results and you can tell me the rest. Uh, an economist will decide, okay, let's take the bull by the horns and let's just see if it's true that government borrowing raises interest rates. I mean, people say that, don't they? Have you heard them say that? You heard me say it, okay. Is it true? All right. Well, let's, let's test it empirically. Now, the way you test it empirically in macro, this is almost true of any kind of a macro test, is you use all the data you have, because you don't have that many data points to start with. You know, you've got one per year. 
uh, one datum per year. And so the data uh, in a pretty standard form are available from right after World War II to the present. So 1946 to present, that's sort of the standard stock uh, empirical data that you have to work with. Okay. And, and so you're testing the proposition, is it generally true using data from 1946 to present that increases in government borrowing cause interest rates to rise? And that study's been done. Let's see if, well, I've got, I've got the other questions. You do similar studies, new deficits cause inflation, okay? And you do it the same way. You use that same data, 1946 to present, to see, okay? Uh, how about do deficits cause trade imbalances? In other words, are there really twin deficits? Test it empirically. Use the data you have, 46 to present, to see. Now, we know, of course, do deficits cause high interest? Well, they did during the Nixon administration because he borrowed domestically and drove up interest rates, right? But does that episode dominate the whole time series from 1946 to present? Turns out if you use all the data from 46 to present, and test for the correlation between deficits and interest rates, you get a result that's best described as weak and mixed, okay? Weak and mixed. And you can see a number of articles in the journals that, that say, do deficits cause higher interest rates? Well, no, we really can't say that at best. The empirical findings are weak and mixed, okay? Well, okay. How about do deficits cause inflation? Well, they certainly did during the Carter administration when he monetized the debt and drove up prices into the double digits. This is called episodal empiricism. That's, that's what the Austrians do. That's what Murray Rothbard did, okay? Episodal. Look at episodes. You see who was actually doing what and what did it cause. Nixon borrowed domestically caused credit crunch. Carter borrowed from the Fed caused inflation, okay? But... Let's be scientific about it, okay? And use all the data from 1946 to present and ask, do deficits generally cause inflation? Can you guess what the results are? Weak and mixed. Okay, well how about do deficit cause trade imbalances? Well, it certainly did during the Reagan administration because <laughs> he borrowed from our foreign trading partners and so those trading partners didn't borrow goods from us and so we were buying more goods than we were selling as a trade deficit. That's what happened. And it's happened like that to one extent or another ever since. Okay. But let's use all the data from 1946 to present and ask, do deficits generally cause trade imbalances? Do you know the answer? We can mix. Okay. Now, you see those articles, and then you see survey articles who, who think that these are too narrow. These... These questions are just too narrowly asked. We need, to, we need to step back and take a broad view and ask the question, what is this thing? Click, click, here we go. There it is. Do deficits cause any problem at all? <laughs> Look at it. <laughs> Don't worry, be happy, okay? It's all as weak and mixed at every turn. <laughs> And that's where the profession is today. If you look at, you know, what mainstream macroeconomics and, and do mainstreamers worry about the deficit, the answer is no. And, 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 and if, you, if you press them on why or not you're worried about it, so well, you know, first and foremost, we're empiricists. We look at the numbers. We look at the facts. Okay, we don't worry about theory for it. Look at the facts, all right? Uh, and, and so they've summed it up. Uh, the deficit seem to pose no problem at all. Now before I go into that, and I don't want to spend too much time on that. Well, I don't really need it back. But, uh, and, and of course, the, I think the more defensible position, which I don't know if I should call it the Austrian position, but it, it certainly fits in with the Austrian way of thinking about things, is, is there is a big reason to worry about the deficits precisely because you don't know uh, which of those effects is going gonna, is gonna to happen. And yet you have to plan your affairs somehow, and you've got to guess about what you're going to be dealing with. And if you guess wrong, you could lose big. And this causes a tremendous burden. So if you overextend your credit and, and there's a credit crunch, you're in trouble, okay? Uh, or if, you're, uh, if you expand an industry that uh, 
relies heavily on sales to foreign countries, you could be in trouble because the deficit is being uh, financed in world credit markets and so on. So uh, anytime we see the deficit to saving ratio growing, and it certainly is now, uh, then uh, I think we can be concerned about the deficit over and above the fact that it's still just another way of financing uh, more government spending. Okay. I uh, don't have much time left, but I want to say a few things about uh, the flat tax. If the screen will let me. Okay. Uh, what's the case for the flat tax? Um, one of the things I want to point out is that what's normally called a flat tax is not flat. Uh, if you look at the Hall Rabushka proposal, they have a book called The Flat Tax, and that was in play during uh, a couple of different presidential uh, elections. And it was broadly seen as, as simply a single low rate applied to all income. Isn't that what a flat tax is? Single low rate applied to all income. And it turns out that in a double barrel sort of way, that wasn't Hall and Rabushka's tax at all. Uh, that their proposed tax was not an income tax, it was a consumption tax. Okay. They were very explicit about that. We advocate a consumption tax, not a tax on income, but a tax on consumption. Consumption is a smaller magnitude than income, and so the tax rate would have to be higher to raise the same revenue. What got exempted, of course, was saving and investment in the name of higher growth. Right? But once you exempt saving and investment, then you've changed from an income tax to a consumption tax, you've narrowed the base, and you've got a higher rate. Plus, it wasn't flat. Uh, the Hall and Rabushka actually argued that one of the admirable features of their taxes is progressivity. Well, I thought flat meant not progressive, isn't that right? But it was progressive, and, and, it, and it had two tax rates, a zero rate, that applied up to $25,000 a year income. And in the uh, reincarnation by Steve Forbes, when he was running for president, he allowed for a $36,000 uh, initial exemption. So you have, you have a stepwise tax, except instead of having a number of small steps, you have one big step. <laughs> okay. So you're taxed at zero up to 36000 and then taxed at a 17 or 19 percent rate. Uh, for all income above that. So it's a progressive tax on consumption because it exempts all saving. Um, let's see. I want to cut to the chase here and argue against the Hall and Rabushka tax uh, as implemented or, or proposed by Steve Forbes. And on the grounds of uh, the political alliance uh, that it creates, let me go through this rather quickly because uh, we're, we're out of time here, running out of time. The alliances I'm talking about is, uh, involves elected officials, low-income taxpayers, and high-income taxpayers. Okay? Maybe I should say low- and middle-income taxpayers. And then ask, consider a flat tax with a $36,000 exemption. So you pay no taxes on the first $36,000 you earn, which means on the first $72,000 you earn, you're still paying only half the average rate as the marginal rate beyond the, uh, beyond the exemption. Now, when you do that, you'll create a certain alliance between elected officials and low-income taxpayers against the high-income taxpayers. I think you can see why. Right? Because the low-income taxpayers are for all sorts of government spending. Why not? They're not paying the taxes. And they're in cahoots with the politicians who are willing to accommodate them and have those, all that government spending is going to be paid for, the high, paid for by the high-income taxpayers. So if you want a flat tax, you better not have a big exemption or you create just exactly the wrong kind of alliance. Right? Uh, and so the alliance, uh, look carefully to my exemption, and you'll see how I'm going to change that, if it'll accommodate me. Have Chad change the battery in this thing. Let me try it over here. <laughs> 
Okay, well, it's failed me. If, uh, if I go to the next slide, I'm going to change that $36,000 exemption to a $36 exemption, okay? Bring it down, so <laughs> I get $36. <laughs> and if you do that, then you change the alliance. Then what's allied is the low-income and, and high-income tax payers against elected officials. And what I would argue is that any tax reform uh, that's worthy of our attention would have to include that feature. You'd, ha you'd have to have, and, and of course, if you have the exemption that low, and you have more people paying taxes, then the rate can come down. So you need, you need all income levels paying a single low rate and being allied with one another against elected officials in order to work as a meaningful tax reform. Well, let me stop there. Thank you very much.